Hello, and welcome to the Nerd Ninja Horror Show. I am your host, Ash Von Horror, along with the Fright Master Freddy, ready to journey into the creepy, crawly, yet always delightful world of horror. Today, we're going to talk about some seriously twisted kids in Omen and Emily. We will also look back on the 1980s slasher classic Maniac and get our sequel talk on Tin Cloverfield Lane. Throw in our home video release of the week, and it looks like we have the makings of fright-filled hour of horror. So let's get started with an iconic horror classic. In 1976, the world was introduced to one of the greatest and most chilling stories of the devil attempting to bring about the end of the world in Richard Donner's The Omen. The story concerns Robert and Catherine Thorne, who have a child. Unbeknownst to Catherine, her child was stillborn. With the advice of a priest at the hospital, Robert exchanges their stillborn son with another child whom had no parents. As the child begins to grow, strange and mysterious things begin to happen. People begin dying all around in freak accidents, while large black dogs begin to roam around the Thorn home. After Damien's nanny hangs herself claiming, it's all for you, a new nanny seemingly comes out of nowhere and acts very strange as if she knows something. With the unusual number of freak accidents that happen, Robert is forced to investigate with a reporter who seems to foresee the deaths of people in the photographs he takes. Their journey leads them to Damien's true origin, which is that of the Antichrist. It is up to Robert to kill his adopted son and save the world, but can he do it? It's one of the greatest thrillers of all time with a bone-chilling score that made us all fear the name Damien. Cut to 30 years later, we pick up from the original film to see Damien as a war photographer. He seems pretty normal and has forgotten his childhood. Until, in the midst of taking pictures, a old woman grabs him and makes him remember his nanny hanging herself. With this unlocked memory, he hunts for answers to his past, trying to figure out who he is. During his quest, strange things begin to happen once again, taking the lives of all around him as he discovers his dark destiny. The new television series entitled Damien premiered last week and were two episodes into the show, which seems to completely ignore parts two and three of the Omen series and goes a very different route with the character and story. Ash, seen both episodes, what do you think so far? I like it. I know that you probably have a difference of opinion on this one, so but many. No. <laughs> I like it. Um, the only thing that's kind of a little confusing is the timeline because... That really threw me off I'm assuming they're completely, like, moving it 10 years forward, which would... Because in the show, he's he just turned 30, mm -hmm. and this movie's, what, 40 years old? So yeah. I'm thinking they're skipping 10 years, and they're just kind of fast-forwarding it so that the time frame fits, but I really don't have any complaints on well, it. Well, that's what threw me off. It's like 1976, that. he's supposedly 8 years old, mm -hmm. now he's 30, so... And this is, this is Bradley James from... The only thing I really knew him from is I had, like, a friend who had these sisters who watched the BBC religiously. There's that show Merlin... And he was I've on that show. I've heard of that show. That's the only thing I know him from. So that's the new Damien right there, which, I mean, as opposed to what I'm used to, which is going to be the Sam Neill Damien. Yeah. That's that's the adult Damien I know. And in the show, it's kind of weird because he doesn't remember anything. You know, he doesn't know his destiny. At that point in the Omen series, the films, Damien had already become like, you know, he's into it. He wants to do it. He was trying to become president, you know, yeah. final conflict. So it was really, it was just, it's weird. I think the th problem I had is I gave it a lot of clout and leeway because I'm like, all right, it's the first episode. You're trying to introduce it to a whole new generation. But at the same time, they're using a lot of clips from the old movie. Yeah, for the original movie. Yeah, so it's like if you already kind of know it, that first episode was really boring to me because you're just reiterating everything that we know, but you're telling Damien this, so he's learning it for the first time. And maybe some people, I don't know what type of people, but maybe they haven't seen the original film, and so yeah. throwing in those flashbacks of the original clips, which I kind of like that they're doing that instead of like having someone else reenact it. Exactly. They actually take the clips from the original movie, and I don't know. I, I mean, it's going to start off slow like any other TV show. They usually tend to start off slow. I think the second episode was a lot better than the that first episode. That was a episode. lot more powerful. Yeah, it was. It had a very intense scene. The There's a scene in the second episode that was really intense when he's at the girl's apartment after all that. I don't want to give 
spoilers away just yet. But that one scene with him and the priest was very, very intense. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of uh, the character-driven stuff there, too. Yeah. The beginning of episode two, and episode two I was really excited for because it's directed by Ernest R. Dickerson, who had directed my favorite Tales from the Crypt movie, Demon Knight. So the guy who made Demon Knight is directing an episode of Damien. I was so ready for it. And there's that first scene where the... Um, the, the sister is, like, performing an exorcism, basically, yeah. which you don't really see in the Omen series originally. So I think they're kind of crossing with new stuff. You know, obviously, we've we got so many. It. Yeah, we got so many exorcism movies that are now. It's just like, oh, well, why don't we do this for the Omen? Uh, so it was, a, it was a lot more powerful episode to me because there was a lot more imagery. Mm -hmm. Definitely had more of a cinematic feel to it, which I think that was all Dickerson doing that. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Greg Mazzara, because he's the guy who produces and writes a lot of the Walking Dead episodes. His favorite show ever. Yeah, totally my favorite show ever. I know I'm probably like one of four people out there that doesn't like the Walking Dead that much. But it's just, it's not, it's becoming a thing where a lot of studios are going out there like, oh, well, we got this horror property, so we need to make it more like the Walking Dead. Because that's yeah. what sells right now. And it's you definitely, you got the character-driven moments in the Walking Dead. That works perfectly for... The Omen, but I don't I don't know completely if everything needs to be like Walking Dead. What do you think about Greg Mazzara I, no, doing I it? I agree. I, I have no problem with him, but like he said with The Walking Dead, I'm one of the few people that's just kind of with that show. But like, I don't I like. Hopefully, they don't keep trying to make like The Walking Dead because The Walking Dead's good for being The Walking yeah. Dead. Don't make everything else like The Walking Dead because the fad's gonna fall out really quick, and then everybody's gonna be totally over it. So when it, especially when it comes to the Omen, like it, it's it's not even in the same category as Walking Dead. Well, and it's a it's a really slow start. Like Bates Motel, which is also on A and E, it kind of like just hit the ground running for yeah, me, and I I you know I ate that up instantly. Uh, I Bates Motel, I saw first season on DVD, just kind of sped through it. With this one, I'm watching every week. Which, by the way, guys, uh, every Monday a new episode airs, and then through that Thursday they have it for free online on the A and E website. You can watch it. Yeah, and if, you, and if you have Verizon on demand, it's free with subscription. To watch yeah, it as well. It's it's not a bad watch. It's interesting because I think for people who aren't familiar with the franchise, that first episode really helps them. It's it's a little weird because like for me, I know so much about it. And I'm kind of going in like, okay, I know this, I know this. It's cool that he's learning it. Yeah. But once again, we've already had a Damien who knew everything. Well, what they said, like, because a lot of people were confused with, like I mentioned earlier, the time frame and everything. And then there's the sequels to The Omen. And so they said that they're completely skipping all the sequels. They're only following the original film. So that's what threw people off because everybody's like, wait, no, this happened and this, this happened. They're completely ignoring that. They're starting completely over after the omen. This is what we're getting. Okay, so they kind of do that on Bates Motel too, where mm -hmm. they like they have a lot of the storylines kind of going there with the modern contemporary take. Do you think with uh the way it's going now, it's basically retelling the stories that we've already had, but do you think it's gonna stray too much from those original things? Or do you think it's going to be like, okay, instead of him learning at a young age, he's going to be learning at a later age, all this stuff, and turning into the Damien we know from the older movies? I think it's, it's, I think as he's learning, we're learning with him. So I'm, mm. I, so I'm like, once he gets his memories back, I'm thinking since he had that long extent of time of not remembering his childhood, he's going to be learning it now. And then I think we're going to see the conflict of whether or not he wants to accept this and embrace the fact that he's the Antichrist, or if he's going to sit here and try to fight it off. Because right now it seems like he doesn't want anything to do with any of it. Well, that's the interesting thing too right now is like you get this really cool parallel where it's like the you know people of God and the church, they send assassins after him. The, the da daggers of Megiddo, which are in the original film, one of them's discovered and there's an assassin that the church sends after Damien. And that happens in the second episode. But you also get, you know, the people who want to kill him and then the people that are supposedly his friends, they're Satanists. Yep. So he doesn't want to trust the Satanists and become the Antichrist so far, but also the good guys are trying to kill him. So the only choice he really has is, you know, suicide, it seems. It would appear that way. But so it's it's really weird because with him, there's no good guys or bad guys. They're all bad to him in some way, shape, or form. So he's like the only protagonist in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I think that's I feel interesting. Bad for him. Yeah, you feel bad for him. And I think that's the thing that's interesting about this movie, or the show I should say, is with the reflections of the movie, 
he did bad things. Like, you see a flashback of him killing his mom from the original movie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see him watching his nanny hang him. It's all for you, Damien. And supposedly, uh, Anne Rutledge, who's in the show, the one that watches him and stuff, she's been with his dad in the, as an ambassador. Robert Hershey's character? Yeah. They've, she's known so them forever. Seen. She's kind of come out of nowhere. She's creepy, too. Oh, my God. She's great at being creepy, though. Yeah. I will say Bradley James, he's, um, I don't know. What do you think of him as Damien? I think he'll grow on me for now. I'm just like, I'm so, like, I don't, like, he's not a bad actor. It's just, like, I don't feel like he's Damien. But then again, it's only the first two episodes. Maybe it'll get better. Because I like everybody else in the show. They're doing yeah. fantastic. But he's not a bad actor. It's just, he he's... It's just that one scene where I'm like, okay, I think this will work. If he can be that intense in that that scene, then I hope that can continue. And then maybe he'll grow on me a little bit Honestly, more. Honestly, at this point, I just hope he doesn't just grow up and turn into the looser for show. <laughs> I like that show. Though. But we've already got that show. Yes, we already know? got that We show, don't need though. another one. Yeah, I don't want him. Yeah, I can understand what you're saying. I don't want, like, I, I want to know if he's going to embrace it or not. And if he does embrace it, I want, like, literally all hell to break loose. But I don't like, but I kind of want to see him struggle with it. Like, I want to see him kind of put up a fight and then maybe just succumb to it and just be like, okay, forget it. I give in. I'm the Antichrist. Let's just, you know, destroy everything. So. I want to welcome I 100 Kings from Russia. Thank you for joining oh, us on the nice. show. New watchers, always cool. Uh, but yeah, it's, I don't know, man. It's, it's interesting. Like I said, I think if you haven't, if you don't know much about the Omen already, then it's going to be kind of cool. Yeah. If you know a lot, you're going to have to wait and like really sink in and just like, oh my God, I've seen this already kind of a little bit. But I still say watch it. Form I think an opinion. It's See an interesting watch. Like I said, the second episode is by Ernest R. Dickerson who did the Demon Knight from Tales from the Crypt. And it's, it definitely shows. There's some really scary scenes. One of my favorite ones is the assassin uh, one of the assassins that's sent after Damien, he's bleeding out, and Damien's like, oh, can I help you? Can I help you? And oh. the dude's just swinging the knives, of, the daggers of my Guido at him, like, bleeding out, guts falling. And I was like, wow, okay, that's a little more extreme than where you've seen in Omen movies. Because Omen movies, a lot of the kills were, like, accidents and stuff like that. It was all inferred. And that was the thing was why no one believed it was the devil, because yeah. they were freak accidents, but it's like, oh, that's explainable, you know. Uh, so we'll see if this show continues or if it gets canceled like other shows. Hopefully it keeps going. A film that hit limited release and video on demand is Dark Sky's film release of Emily. This film is the worst nightmare for any parent. Emily tells us the story about the Thompsons who want to have a nice night out for their anniversary. When their babysitter cancels at the last minute, she suggests her friend Anna to take her place and babysit. At first, Anna seems like the perfect babysitter and friend of the kids, letting them play and have extra cookies. But soon, her niceties descend into devilish torture upon the kids in the most shocking and depraved ways. The trailer itself is intense, and I was really excited to see this. Ash, what did you think about it? This movie is so uncomfortable. It's awesome. <laughs> it's not visually uncomfortable. It is mentally uncomfortable because some of the things that goes on, you don't necessarily see it but you know what's happening and just to me it made me uncomfortable the whole entire time i was watching it especially anything involving children so many things come to your mind when it involves children especially when it's in the horror genre and this it just completely made me uncomfortable it definitely keeps you guessing the whole time like yes, what's going to happen to these kids because throughout the movie as you know emily is watching the kids she's doing some really messed up stuff and you the don't, trailer shows you a glimpse of that. Too. It does. And you don't really feel safe for the kids at all. Because mm -mm. she's pretty much torturing them and like kind of putting them through her own trials. And you're trying to figure out why she's yeah. doing this. Because you have no idea who this chick is. Well, And some of it, even by the end, is never like truly explained mm -hmm. other than she's just gone insane. Uh, it's directed by Michael Thelen, who, this is his first feature film. And I was like really, I saw the trailer and I liked it a lot. But I was really skeptical with like him as a director because the only thing he's done he's like done some paramore music videos and a bunch of other like bands that i obviously would not care about at all he loves paramore. oh yeah totally uh we also got richard raymond harry heberk he's this is his first movie he's written but i thought it was funny he's was an assistant on both cloverfield and cabin in the woods nice so we got newbies here but Richard Raymond, I thought was a little more okay i can trust this guy he's worked on some more genre familiar. films before yeah plus 
Cabin in the Woods is like one of my favorite movies of all time. Anybody who's worked on that, fantastic I'm like, all right, movie. we're good. Let's do this. Um, Sarah Bolger, man. What do you think of her as Emily? She nailed the creep factor, that's for sure. And she's like so cute and sweet and innocent. And I don't think I've ever seen her in a horror movie. I'm trying to think of it now. But like, she's just like, no, I take that back. She was in the movie with Olivia Wilde. Uh, Lazarus Effect. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 so I take that back. She was in a horror movie, and she's a cutesy little character in that, so that's why I completely forgot. But she can play Psycho perfectly. Like, I think that's why they, they probably, probably why they hired her, because she looks innocent, she looks trusting, and then you find out that she's insane. She can turn it off and on real quick, yes, she too. Can. Like, one second, she's like the nicest person in the Smiling world. Smiling and happy. And then the next minute, she's like, no. It's time for you to go to bed. Yeah. Or, no, like, hold this gun. The scene yeah. with the camera when she's taking pictures of the children. You see it in the trailer. She's like sitting there smiling, taking pictures, and she's telling the, the boy to make it look like he's hitting his sister. The sister's smiling, and she's like, stop smiling. And then yeah. she looks at her again, and her face just goes from smile to like dead serious, and she's like, stop smiling. This poster right here is one of my favorite posters for the film, too, because this is one of the best scenes in the movie. Yes, so she's is. sitting there with the, one of the, the youngest kid. And she's reading him a bedtime story. And if you notice, it's a notebook. She's telling the kid her story of her life. With her drawings. With her it. drawings. I thought it was really cool because Sarah Bulger actually got to draw different things in there. And what she would do was there's a lot of nuances throughout the movie telling mm -hmm. you this character and why she's the way she is. But Sarah Bulger herself actually for the acting process would think, okay, why is she like this? Why is she doing this? And would write them in the book and write nice. little stories of what made her her. And those so drawings I, were disturbing. They were some really disturbing drawings. They actually have some close-ups in the movie about them, and they look really freaky. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to say why she's doing it. Don't either. But it's so <laughs> sadistically sad. Yes, it's it's sad. You do have a little because the thing is, she is really a tragic character in her own sense. It's one of the. It's very contemporary too. It's one of the saddest things that happens in modern America. I feel like a lot, but the other thing that on the opposite end of that spectrum is she does so many other crazy things that have no rhyme or reason. So like, you don't feel sympathy for her Exactly. Anymore. And there's like some scenes where she's punishing the kids, trying to teach them life, but not teaching them the right way. No. It's almost like these, it, it gives you a feeling like she was raised on the streets in some way. This is how mm -hmm. I learned it. This is how you're going to learn it. And these are some kind of sheltered and protected kids. Yeah. And, and like, she's a complete stranger. They don't know who she is. And I'm just like... Like, you'd think, oh, like, typical stranger babysitter. Oh, they're going to be all nice, sweet, like how she is in the beginning. And then, no, <laughs> not even close. It kind of reminded me of us. It, not the movie itself, but the character of Angela from Sleepaway Camp a little bit. Almost like, because if you watch the Sleepaway Camp series, the first one's like the serious one, even though mm -hmm. it's goofy as hell. And then the second and third one, which has Bruce Springsteen's sister as Angela for some reason, it just gets super goofy and weird. It's almost like they took the character of Angela, I think, this, you know, tragic person, mm -hmm. and made her, kept her serious. Yeah. That's kind of how I felt about her. I agree. So I was, man, I, I was just blown away by this movie. I remember actually, after Ashley watched it, she was like, so I watched the movie, and I was like, isn't it the greatest thing in the world? And she goes... I was perturbed through the whole thing. It's so <laughs> uncomfortable. Well, and some of the visuals are uncomfortable too because like you get the shots of like her holding the gun to the kids' heads yeah. or like there's a scene where uh, and it's this is the amazingness of sound effects. They're watching a movie. I don't want to say what they're watching, but Emily pops in, forces the kids to watch, and all you do is watch the kids sit there looking really confused and one of them looking petrified as you hear these sounds of what the movie is and you see the screen like the light from the screen on their faces and trust me when i say you'll know what type of movie it is immediately but we don't see what it is yeah. and just seeing the kids reaction was enough to just make you like you feel so bad for these kids and this is coming from someone who doesn't like children i felt so bad for these kids especially the little girl yeah I felt so much sympathy for her. Also, at the same time, I feel like it's also somewhat of a coming of age story because the older brother, who's like, what, 13 in the movie? They say, I think 11 or 12. 11 or 12, yeah. yeah. He has to kind of, he has to become the role of the big brother, the responsible adult, and take care of his siblings for once. Because at first. And he's starting to kind of hit puberty. Yeah, and at first, it's really creepy because he and Emily are hitting it off like kind of really flirtatious. 
and it got like re- Norman and his mother exactly and it got really weird and that's the thing too that it was like she started off as this like oh the cool you know teenage babysitter is gonna let me play video games and draw do all this on stuff. the walls exactly and cookies. but every time she would do something really nice to them it would pull out something equally evil or bad mm-hmm. and so it was real i think the most uncomfortable thing for me was to watch them the the youngest or the oldest brother and emily kind of build this weird relationship it was that and was she, that was uncomfortable she wouldn't hide anything from him like there's the there's a scene? there's a bathroom scene oh my god like i'm gonna let you guys just imagine how that goes but like I said, I think it's kind of a coming of age story because he really comes into his own and he has a best friend in the treehouse, which for me, I'm like, oh God, there's a contemporary movie with a treehouse in it. <laughs> like you don't see that in films these days anymore. So it kind of harkened back to my love of like 80s stuff like that. And the kids kind of came up and like actually fought Emily. Yeah. And it was really cool because like I said, he just comes into his own. Yeah, because you see him go from like not wanting anything to do with his little brother and sister to doing everything in his possible power to the save his brother of them, yeah. his sister. And keep in mind that the the character Emily is supposed to be like what our age, we, like between mine and his age, like t- between twenty four to twenty eight years old. And these kids are eleven, nine, and four years old. Yeah, like there's a major age difference, and it's just so uncomfortable. There, oh, she has an accomplice too. A crazy accomplice, which you don't really ever get in. You don't know. You don't know. It's almost like I remember somebody was talking to Sarah Bolger and she was saying it was like Emily herself was a force of nature. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like she could be the new Jason in my eyes. I don't think she she says she doesn't want to carry a franchise. I think you easily could carry a franchise with this character if you take it in crazier ways. Yeah. There are so many slasher movies that you could do with that. But this one, I'm like, oh, my God. Because if you think about with the reason why she's babysitting these kids, she's obviously done this a lot and to yes, other has. families. And You see it she, in the flashbacks a little bit. Yeah, and she has a little. whole book of them. So you could have like done a whole series on like this is what she did here and this is what she learned here and this is where she discovered. They could give us this. a prequel, even though they like you know we see her a little bit of her backstory in the movie. We they could have done easily a prequel of the, like the aftermath of like why she is the way she is now. So they they could easily do that too if they wanted, and then we don't because we don't know everything that she's done at all. So it could work. If she wanted to, it could work. So I know I definitely love this movie. It's one of my favorite thrillers I've seen this year. What do you give it, Ash? I think I highly recommend people watching it, but I'm warning you now, it's very uncomfortable. Those thumbs up for uncomfortability, guys. Yeah. So March 6th was the 35th anniversary of one of the most notorious and controversial slasher films of its time, William Lustig's Maniac. The brainchild of ingenious character actor Joe Spignall, who had been in some of Hollywood's most prestigious films as a secondary character, decided it was time to come up with a heavy character piece he could star in that would showcase all of his acting talents. Maniac tells the story of Frank Zito, a man who had been abused most of his childhood. As an adult, he becomes a shut-in, talking to himself and his menagerie of mannequins that all have one distinct feature, the scalps of his victims. He takes his rage and confusion out on society and women of the night that remind him of his mother. That combination gives us one of the bloodiest and most thought-provoking slashers to hit the big screen. Ash... I've loved this movie for so long. It's one of, like I said, you said it was one of the most notorious slashers of its time. The Tom Savini effects themselves, those were legendary in that movie. I remember. Especially the car scene. Oh, yeah, yeah. The shotgun in the head, guys. If you guys have seen Maniac, you know the most ingenious scene ever is you got Tom Savini, of course, the effects guy, playing him, playing a guy in the movie, trying to get lucky in the car. The disco guy? Yeah, disco sleaze guy. And so he's about to go. You know, he's driving off, and he starts the car up, lights come on, and Frank, Frank Zito has a giant shotgun, and he comes up, jumps in the car, and blows Savini's head right off. Guts everywhere. It was Literally one of, blows his head It off. was one of the most intense scenes I've seen in a slasher flick, and that, I remember that was one of the things that was like, this is one of the few movies where they got Savini to do blood effects and gore effects, and they're like, you know what? Savini is awesome at this. X rating. Let's keep it that way. So I've always loved this movie. Ash, this is the first time you've seen it. What'd you think? I enjoyed it. I couldn't stand staring at his character, but Joe I enjoyed Spino. it. Joe Spinell. He is so. It's like 
if when you watch the Human Centipede Part Two and you see the fan that you know recreates oh, Tom, the Human Tommy Centipede, Nicks or whatever. how just disgusting that dude is in general is how I felt about this guy. Like I just could, I just just looking at him made me uncomfortable, and he just felt dirty and gross. He was obviously psychotic, and people were just like saying hi to him and not even realizing they're like next door to a freaking psychopath. Well, and that's one of the things I love too. Was uh, back in the '70s, there was a lot. There were a lot of like actors in New York and LA that kind of came together with like Scorsese and the rest of them, and they would do like Francis Ford Coppola movies. You have all those like prestige movies that were like kind of underground at the time, but then became bigger movies. So Joe Spinell was in like. You know, he's in Rocky, he was in a lot of Scorsese movies, he's in mm -hmm. Ford Coppola movies with The Godfather. He always played like this well-to-do guy or like a street thug from Rocky. And so he always had these bit parts, but he'd make so much money on them because they were some of the most successful and iconic movies in history. So he kind of put this together because he wanted to showcase all his different talents. And Spinel himself, he's not the best looking guy, I'll give you that. But you got to give the man this. He is an amazing actor, and he brought a lot to that role. Oh, yeah. You you think he's actually a psychopath. Yeah. Because not only does he look the part, he acts the part very well. Oh, yeah, easily. And the, the scalp scene. Yeah. What did you think of that? Oh, I love it. The more bloodier, the better. And exactly like I said in the scenes, too, uh, ah, he would take the scalps of his victims and put them on these mannequins. As seen in the picture? Yeah, and he would start talking to them. Like, And a lot of times it kind of alluded to the fact that, like, they were kind of his girlfriends that weren't good enough for his mom. Very much Norman Bates kind of mm. stuff like that. Mm. And it's it's so creepy and crazy. He's like nailing the scalps into them. And he's like, oh, you got to behave. And when he's talking be to the victims themselves, like before he does this, it's like he's talking to his mother. Exactly. It's, it's very so Norman Batesy. <laughs> well, I love it too. Uh, so uh, the original idea was, I think, Frank Pesh, who had been in like The Godfather, a bunch of other movies like that. He had come to uh, Lustig and said, let's make Jaws on land. That was the entire thought process for it. And so from there, they kind of got Joe Spinell on board. And he's like, oh, I got these ideas. Let's do that. And the thing I love about this film is it's so indie. It's so low budget. Very they low budget. They took a lot of – there's a helicopter shot. They actually just were on second unit for uh, Dario Argento's Inferno. And we're shooting some helicopter scenes. Whatever footage they didn't use, they'd steal it, take it to Maniac. Uh, Joe Spinell was working on Nighthawks, which was a, a big budget movie back then for Universal. And they took the makeup effects team when Savini wasn't available and used them mm -hmm. to do some of the makeup and stuff. So it was just so low budget. But the other thing, too, is I thought they had like a lot of ingenious things. Lustig, one of my favorite things he talks about on the documentary, uh, is if you look at Every time he goes to his apartment, you, you never really know what Joe Spinell's job is. But on the wall next to his door, there's a like giant little case of keys. Yeah, I so totally noticed it, that in the movie. So it alludes to the fact that he's the superintendent of his building, which is why every time he comes in, there's people there. They're like, oh, hey, hey, Mr. Zito. Yeah, they're just like, oh, hey, how are you? Christmas shopping? Yeah, exactly. And, and like, he's carrying in a giant body. Uh, yeah, obviously, trash bag, huge thing with this tiny little bag. Are you Christmas shopping? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, sure, whatever, man. But I, and I love Joe Spinell in this movie. Sadly, too, he, uh, he had filmed a part two, uh, and it was going to be like a Mr. Rogers thing where mm -hmm. basically he was this other character who was kind of like Mr. Rogers, and he would go out when kids would send him letters like, my parents abuse me, he would go out and kill the parents or whoever abused them. And he shot a short film for it, but sadly, like... Not too long after he shot that short film, when they were getting ready to roll cameras on the actual sequel, he uh, he had hemophilia, and he cut his, uh, I think, his arm open. And hemophilia, basically, it's like the clotting of blood yeah. doesn't work properly. So basically, he fell asleep and bled to death because he couldn't, his blood couldn't clot properly. Yeah. So it was like, it was really sad because I was, you know, he's a really nice guy from everything I heard. Uh, Luke Walker was his assistant on a maniac and on the commentary for maniac because he died before they had any mm -hmm. director's comedy and stuff commentary and stuff like that. He worked really close with him and talked about all the stuff they did. Like they would do night shots. They would basically take the camera cause they couldn't shoot during night and you know, Lustig would film everything during the day. Well, Joe Spinell and Luke Walker would take the script, take the camera, and start shooting stuff at night whenever they could find anything that would work with the script. And that's how they got a lot of it done. You also had uh, Carolyn Monroe, who played Anna, the mm -hmm. photographer kind of love interest. She's really cool. She was from the Hammer films, like Kronos, and she was also in the original Casino Royale. And one of my 
favorite Vincent Price movies, The Abominable Dr. Fibes. So it had a lot of geek street cred for horror stuff. Um, I know this one I'm going to give to you because I know you want to talk about it. There's a scene at the end where basically uh, Joe Spinell just goes utterly insane, you know, crying over his mother's grave and starts choking Anna, his lover, and she like knocks him out, kind of stabs him, and he runs back to his apartment and he's like lying there and the mannequins come to life. Yeah, all the victims mm -hmm. come back. The best part is this is one of my favorite Tom Savini effects. I'm going to let you handle that so, one. So <laughs> as you see the mannequins come to life, it's each victim he's had. There's one that pops up on the side of the bed, and it's completely headless. It was Betsy Palmer's headless corpse at the end from Friday the 13th, and it was the greatest moment ever. Although I bet you didn't have tassos like hairy knuckles like they did in the original Friday the 13th. No, just kind of bobbing. It's blood squirting out. There's no head, and you're like, wait, which victim was this one? Right. Is that mommy? Right. <laughs> well, it's at, right at 1980 as well, and that's, uh, I guess, a, you know, five, six, seven years before Day of the Dead. Day of the Dead has one of my favorite Savini effects where the zombies are pulling off this guy's head and as they're pulling it off the vocal cords are tearing so it's like ah, and it like gets high pitched well they kind of do an effect like that for when the mannequins start tearing apart joe spinnell and they tear his head off and it looks awesome he's just watching the skin just stretch yeah. out all gnarly and he's just <laughs> left there for dead now this is all in his head of course so when the cops come after uh anna you know calls him's like hey this guy's going crazy they come and find him and he's just got like a giant knife in him and stabbed and, himself yeah he stabbed himself because there's nowhere at any point does he have a like knife like that that stabs mm. him or anything like that so basically because of his guilt and everything i feel like he kind of killed himself thinking it was the mannequins killing him yeah so, because it's a very intense scene with all those mannequins it's so they're unnerving. all up in yeah. his face they're laughing he's screaming bloody murder this is the first time you see like i mean like throughout the film you do see him crying but this is like the first time you see him actually like terrified yeah and then just them ripping that was the best part of the movie when he when he's killing his victims too he does it like so nonchalantly like almost mm -hmm. like he's devoid of life and then afterward that's when he's just kind of like kind of breaks down it's very it, you know I, you could say it's kind of a psycho ripoff but it's more of like when you you're trusting Norman Bates because Anthony Perkins is such a nice looking kind of normal person. So Joe innocent. Spinell is not a nice looking kind of guy, but he is a very timid kind of guy when you talk to him. Yeah, because he's like a big dude, but he's just like just little. I don't know. So nasty looking though. Yeah, pretty much. I. I mean, you know, it works for him. It, it worked. It worked completely. Yeah, because like, I mean, because I was thinking of Psycho when I watched it, but the difference is with, with Norman Bates, he had that trust, like, trustly figure about him. This guy, I couldn't figure out why people were trusting him at all. Like, why would you want to be left in the room alone with this guy? Because he did not look trustworthy at all whatsoever. Was it true? Uh, th uh, we got 4 talking to us right now. I think it's true that Tony Perkins died in car accident too, right? I think so. I know Tony Perkins was dead, but I didn't know it was like car accident. I, yeah, I was going to say, same thing. I didn't, I didn't know how, but I would, I would think so. Yeah. This is when I would bust out my phone out and be like, I'm like, checking. Check <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming so. Well, we've talked the original. So I'm going to go into something else here. Quite often, contemporary artists try to tackle classic material in an attempt to bring it to a new generation. In most cases, we get the Cabin Fever remake. Go watch last week's show and you'll hear all about it. But every now and then we get a nugget of gold that shines in a sea of heartless imitations. To me, Frank Calhoun's Maniac is one such gem. Produced by known horror director Alejandre Alja, who gave us such films as High Tension, Horns, and yes, Piranha 3D. Yeah. Along with acting skills of Elijah Wood, Calhoun's remake give, gives loving nods to the source material while expanding upon certain ideas, thanks to a higher budget, that gives way too many artistic choices in the aesthetic look of the film. One major difference in this film, compared to the original, is the first-person perspective of Frank Zito. Once again, troubled by his sordid past, which creeps into his adult life, this version of Frank is perhaps more unnerving, yet more sympathetic at the same time. Ash, what were your thoughts on the parallels for the two movies? I say this is a really good remake. It's one of the few. I will it's give it. It's one of the few. I can count off my favorite remakes on my hand. 
Yeah, this was one of the few. Normally when you hear remake, I'm one of the first people that's like, why? Why are you remaking this movie? But when it comes to this one, it stuck to the source material. It, it did its own thing, but it still stuck to the source material. So it was like, it was borderlining. And I personally, I know this is going to kill him, which is okay. But I actually like this one better than the original. How shocking. <laughs> Dear God. It's more gory. Dude, what? To me, it's more gory. Ch it was okay hold up now i'm sorry i just like lost my my mind there do you say okay i'll give you this it's they're both x-rated they yes. are both x-rated but this you're saying had a lot more nudity yeah it was that well you know french extremism but tom savini you're saying it's more gory I, than no tom I, i'm not dissing tom Sa savini at all whatsoever he's twiddling his mustache somewhere yeah I like I, i'm pretty girl. sure he's like evil glaring me right now and i am so sorry but like I like I am I'm not dissing his effects whatsoever. If you know me, you know I'm a huge fan of his. But when it came to this one, it's it's I guess more up to speed. I don't know. It's just like you're you're seeing like I think it's the fact that you're seeing Elijah Wood do this, and he's so cutesy and tiny and a little hobbit, and you're That's seeing him hobbit. rip people's like the way he tears their scalps off is just I loved it so much. So for me, there are two things when they cast Elijah Wood, which we're about to pull up right now. We have. Uh, Alejandra Aja, one of my favorite directors coming up at the time. I love Piranha 3D. I loved High Tension. I loved Horns. He could not do wrong in my eyes. He was producing it and he helped write it. Then they brought on Elijah Wood. And I was like, all right. So he did very well as a maniac in Sin City. But oh, yeah, sure. for me, Joe Spinnell was such an iconic classic slasher and that cover for the original maniac he looks so gnarly and disgusting they showed it in the, this movie though they too. they did they did in but one of the kills. it wasn't when i first saw the first still of elijah wood i was like all right i guess he can do it because i've seen him play crazy but i haven't seen him play dirty crazy kevin from sin city was a completely different kind of crazy yeah z warcats in the chat said that elijah plays creepy very well he does play creepy very well uh so i, I was a little skeptical at first but i like i said i love alejandro aja i'll follow him into battle pretty much so then we get elijah wood here and that's that's Look what he looks him. like he's just so like I'm so innocent sad. and sad and puppy dog face. And then look blood. <laughs> now you'll see here, you can see his reflection in the mirror. As we said before, the whole movie's told from first person perspective. So they had to do a lot of mirror tricks mm -hmm. to actually hide the camera when you saw him in the mirror. To my knowledge, actually, you don't see him really uh, till after the third kill in the film. And after the third kill, every time he kills, it goes from first person to an aerial shot over his head and you yep. see him. And it's really cool because you spend a good chunk of the movie seeing through his eyes and by that third kill, every kill after that is just his face and his reaction to yeah. the things. I like that though. I like it that we really got to cool. see it from the killer's point of view. Well, and that's what really got to me too was I was like, oh my God, this is a completely different movie. And it to me felt like the first time we really get a first person perspective slasher film is the original Halloween. Uh, if you want to go even further beyond that, we're going to go with Bob Clark's 1974's Black Christmas, which you never actually see the killer at all in that movie. You see from his perspective. So I was like, all right, they took Bob Clark's 1974 Black Christmas storyline and they basically took that camera and said, that's the whole movie. Mm. Or they either saw Halloween and thought, all right, that first opening sequence from Michael Myers, Michael Myers as a child and they took that and made it into a full feature. So those, I think, probably pulled very heavily from those. Because I know Bob Clark was really proficient in like the horror scene, talking to new people and stuff like that. I don't know if he was still alive I'm when sure Alejandro Aja was doing stuff like this. But I mean, certainly he had to have talked to Carpenter at some point about some stuff. Yeah, because, because he got inspiration. You can see it, in the, like as you're saying, you can see it in the movies, definitely. Yeah. I didn't even think of Black Christmas until you said it. And I'm like, that's what it well, is. Black Christmas <laughs> is one of my favorite movies of all time. I was thinking Halloween, and then you said that, and I'm like, yes, there there you go. That's a good way to describe this movie. So I also just want to, for like, you know, giggles here. My favorite kill in the movie is the one moment in the whole movie where I just laughed my ass off. And it's, there's this guy who, uh, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm in those commercials where, you know, perfect smile, ha-ha. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I want you to die. I hate you so much. Instant kill. And so Elijah Wood takes a meat cleaver and slashes him across his perfect smile. Bam. Well, now he's smiling even more. Perfectly and eternally. Mm -hmm. I also thought it was pretty awesome. So he goes, in this movie version, um, 
he actually goes on more dates with Anna. Yeah, he does. And it's actually more of a relationship. That was another big difference because you kind of got the ideas of a relationship in the original, but you saw one budding here. Also, though, in this version, Anna has a girlfriend who is the, or a boyfriend, sorry, who is the biggest jackass in the world. You kind of want him to kill him. Like, he is torturing Frank Zito in the movie. Like, and he's not even doing anything. I mean, given this is a killer, keep yeah. this in mind that we're having sympathy for the killer. But he's, like, completely so timid and innocent. And, like, you know, that scene with the boyfriend, you're just like, dude, why are you being such a dick? Yeah. He didn't do anything to you. Why yeah. are you being such a dick? <laughs> You deserve to die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the relationship is definitely more fleshed out, and you can see that Elijah Wood truly loves Anna. Mm -hmm. The weirdest thing, though, and I thought this was really cool, is they go to a late-night movie, and they both go and see The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which in of itself is like an old-school slasher film at the end of the day when you think about it. And so he's watching these like brutal killings and stuff like that, and he's freaking out kind of the whole time. While he's looking at Anna, He would. It was, it's really cool. You kind of see him have an anxiety attack. You do see him have an anxiety attack, yeah. but the other thing I thought was really cool was he's looking at the film and it's freaking him out but then he looks at her and it's clarity mm -hmm. and that's the one difference i thought was with joe spinnell's film he would look at her and he kind of he kind of want to kill her you know because he loved her but it would go back to the whole mommy thing with elijah wood's character it was oh god i want to kill everyone but you Mm -hmm. You are my world. You're my perfect. Yeah, he one. didn't. It, it didn't seem like he had a real purpose on killing her. It felt like he wanted to keep her. Exactly. But it didn't seem like he wanted to kill her. Unlike the original, like you said, where it's like you can tell that he's like, I just want to scalp you. You definitely have more sympathy for him in this movie. Yeah, um, it's more sympathy. I thought it was also cool because Elijah was technically part of the camera work here, so he would be behind uh, the camera guy. So you'd have in this three people job. There'd be the camera guy, Elijah Wood right here with his arm, and another guy that was a body double of Elijah Wood on this side with his arm. They found someone tiny enough? Apparently Hobbit-like. <laughs> so it was like a three-man job, and because of that, a lot of the dialogue in the movie was all in ADR mm -hmm. afterward, that they would have to re record it and stuff. So I thought that was pretty cool that you got to see like an actor get in with like the ground level stuff. So a lot of that was Elijah Wood having to choreograph with three people's Three Stooges style, I'm going to say. Talent right there. Exactly. So I was pretty psyched about it. The thing I love, though, is people's reactions to this movie. Because we'll talk about Cloverfield later. And you guys remember when that movie came out, they had signs at AMC like saying, be careful, may cause motion sickness. Dude, people coming out of this movie because you're watching the killer... Mm -hmm. And from his perspective, they were fainting, they were vomiting, they were going crazy. And that elicited in me the feeling of Alex from A Clockwork Orange. Because the audience essentially becomes Alex. Yep. So for all the people and critics out there that are calling this a vile, disgusting piece of filth, I will say this. If you think about it, in The Clockwork Orange, Alex was tortured with those images and he was felt sick seeing them and didn't want to commit any atrocities or anything mm -hmm. like that. Could this, in that sense, be the same thing? People watching these atrocities and being put in those shoes would put them off from that. Yeah, because you see him vomiting and getting sick mm -hmm. and getting like looking like he's going to faint, get severe migraines, has anxiety attacks. Like you're kind of going with the flow with him as it's happening. So if I feel like some people like. Let's be honest now. Some people do have, you know, those dark thoughts every now and then. So I think most people that were actually affected by it may have been like feeling the same as he was. And then yeah. having to actually witness it from his point of view just kind of ended up making them sick. In my case, I thought it was amazing. So I, I don't guy, know what that says about me. I have Ezekiel saying he had nightmares from watching Cloverfield. Dude, you would have like the worst <laughs> oh, nightmares no. from watching this movie. Don't watch this movie. Then. Yeah, it no, is wait, hardcore. Watch it. Like maybe I said, Freddy will pop up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Sea War Cats, thank you for the $25 donation. Thank you. We will not vomit on you, commit atrocities, I or bleed on you. you. Like She's I do a, him. She tries to every time. But yeah, I highly recommend this movie. That's coming from a guy who's like, I can name five remakes on my hand that I like. This is This is a worthy remake. And it's almost like two different films. You can watch them both. I love them both. I watched so, them back to back. And the biggest thing that makes me sad about this is Frank Calhoun proved that he can take a prior property and make it its own thing, make it something equally as awesome. He directed the Amityville Awakening movie, which is supposed to come out April 1st. We were going to have a whole episode doing the Amityville movies next week, but the studio Dimension decided that they were going to pull it and ship it all the way to January 1st. 
So this got me thinking. Wait even longer. Exactly. Got me thinking. I looked into it. Apparently, Calhoun's movie has been completely changed and taken out of his hands. Sheesh. And what makes me sad about that is, you know, he's like that French extremism kind of horror. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen that kind of horror in an Amityville movie since Amity Two, the Amityville Two, The Possession, which is possibly one of the craziest sequels of all time, and one of the only ones that's worthy of being a true horror movie. So that. Honestly, that just made me really sad. But guys, definitely check out Maniac. It was on Netflix for a while, but it's on DVD now as well. It is awesome. Yeah, seriously, go watch it. And then tell us what you think about it. So now to jump over to something a little more mainstream, 1-1808 was the title and release date we were given to a secret film being made by J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot Production Company. The trailer featured a party that was soon interrupted by a huge explosion in New York, giving way to mass panic and destruction. Directed by Matt Reeves and written by Drew Gard, and finally given the name Cloverfield, we were given our first American kaiju film. The story centers on Rob and his going away party where we are introduced to his friends and their drama. New York is attacked by a huge monster and Rob and his friends must venture out into the war zone that was their home to help save the love of Rob's life, Beth. Their friend HUD, who had been filming testimonials for the party about Rob, becomes the audience's eyes and ears as he documents their horrific journey, which gives us a found footage narrative. So... A lot of people were very put off by this movie. I remember seeing it in theaters. I was just like, oh my God, we have an American kaiju movie. That's all I've wanted. I didn't even see it when it came out in theaters. Really? Okay, so it was so cool for me because, first of all, we're definitely in a time period where seeing original properties is really hard to get. Mm -hmm. And around the time this one was coming out is when it was first starting, like all the superhero movies, all the remakes. They're turning toy lines into movies. Yeah, 2008. 2008, yeah. And so... I remember it was so cool because going up to the theater, they had the the little signs. It's like, due to the nature of this movie, you might feel motion sickness. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. It reminded me of like the stuff like Vincent Price would do back in the day, like House on Haunted Hill with the skeletons going through the audience. So I was thinking Blair Witch because I remember the warnings too, yeah. on that one too because it's the handheld camera effect and a lot of people can't handle all that motion, especially in this one because – it kind of gets your motion sickness a little bit. After yeah. you watch it over and over, that feeling goes away. But the first time around, I can only imagine seeing it on a theater. Imagine those people up front that got stuck with those front row seats watching that. I'm pretty sure they got sick. <laughs> can we pull up the picture of the creature real quick? Show you guys. See if you remember. There we go. Look how adorable he is. That was the first time we saw him in the movie for real. We saw a glimpse and bits of him, but... Yeah. That was the coolest thing to me was uh, it's like the old school kaiju movies where like you would see bits and pieces and then all of a sudden like grandiose moment. And mm -hmm. for me, this was like a really cool payoff because I thought, I thought he looked awesome. Yeah. And then the fact that HUD literally watches him devour him. Yeah, that was that was. That was, for me, that was a heartbreaking moment because I loved HUD. He's that stupid idiot we all have as a friend. Yeah, I felt, oh, that scene was so sad though but yeah. i love that scene that's like the that's my favorite scene in the whole entire movie is because you got to witness it instead of seeing it from someone else's point of view you're seeing it from the person's dying point of view now i know a lot of people complain about the first like 20 to 30 minutes of it as at the party being mm -hmm. like oh it's just a bunch of generic douchebags and i'm like okay yeah but then you get our main cast who are all pretty likable and yeah. as the movie progresses you see their relationships because they're all willing to lay down well, their see lives i liked all of them other. but the girlfriend oh uh lily the beth Oh, Beth. Well, Beth, like, you kind of hate her from the get-go because you're like, you yeah. broke Rob's heart. Why? Just the way she acted, I'm just like, why are you going to go save her? She's not worthy. I mean, you and you're in love. <laughs> Maybe. I, I loved, my favorite moment, honestly, was uh, HUD hitting a Marlena the whole time. Mm -hmm. But when they go to, like, the little camp where they're in the Macy's or whatever, and she he turns around and sees her, like, bleeding out of her eyes. Like, yeah. I don't feel so good. And you, like... Get to, that was a really cool moment because you get to see from HUD's perspective how he's freaking out and she just explodes. Yeah, because you can't keep calm when you see someone bleeding out yeah. of their eyeballs and then all of a sudden army taking them away and you're you're so much confusion and panic and then poof. Yeah, and that's the cool thing too is a lot of the death scenes other than HUD's, which I think that was really effective, they're not really lingered on. No, they just they're happen, they're done, and it's just like so quick, and you're not given time to register everything. I think they wanted you to connect to HUD. Exactly, and so that was the thing. When you watch it in the monster's mouth being eaten up, that was so cool to me. Um, so J.J. Abrams actually had the idea first off when he went to Japan, was in a toy store with his kids, saw a kaiju, and was like, oh, we don't have an American kaiju. The other link I really love, because J.J. Abrams is such a huge geek, it's not even funny. One of my favorite John Carpenter movies of all time, Escape from New York 
where they have the um, Statue of Liberty head going through the streets, he actually took that from the poster of Escape from New York. So that was an awesome thing to me. That was an intense scene, too. That was. And that was like, holy crap. Because you weren't expecting that? that to fly out. And then Mm-mm, just there's her head. All. And you're like, wait, what just took out that? And it was some like flawless editing yes, and CGI almost, too. Because oh usually God. CGI is a little iffy. It yeah. has its moments. That was just like smooth sailing. And then you're just sitting there like, what just what? What? Like, what was that? So what, what does my heart good right now is a lot of people on chat are saying a lot of really good things about this film, which makes me happy because when I went and saw it, I walked out of the theater thinking, oh, man, that was so awesome. And everybody was like, oh, yeah, that sucked. See, for me, like, because I, I just didn't go see it in theaters. I can't remember what I was doing at that time, but I just didn't go see it. I ended up renting it and watching it. You were and making like, a Cloverfield movie in your basement? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and so, like, with me, like, with these types of films, sometimes I usually wait until after theater because I don't like dealing with the people. But, like, I heard nothing but good things when people came out of the theater. Or maybe I just know people with good taste in movies. Zeke, you do need to watch this again. This is an awesome movie. Watch it. That Okay, that was the other thing, too. The secrecy. Mm-hmm. was it 1-1808 didn't know anything about it i remember people were like trying to figure out what it was got that was a voltron movie was it a clip of nothing yeah exactly and so that was so cool to see that because you have so many trailers out now that give away the movie you're seeing everything you're seeing all the money shots all the good stuff and this one you're just like you're seeing like the first 10 minutes of the movie and that's it mm-hmm. and that got your butt in that seat and you saw this awesomeness Yep. So that was so cool to me. And the thing, too, was Paramount's a really big studio, and they were all for hiding the project. Which is kind of shocking. Exactly. And so it's it's really the brainchild of, you get J.J. Abrams, who came up with the idea, Drew Goddard, who directed and wrote Cabin in the Woods, did a lot of the new Daredevil stuff coming out. He uh, wrote the project. And then Matt Reeves, who did the remake of Let the Right One and Let Me In, which I love, and he's doing the Planet of the Apes movies now, he directed it. And so... That was like the holy triumvirate for me for a while. And they all went on to do huge things, like I've said. Um, the other thing I love, Phil Tippett, who worked in the real Star Wars movies, his studio was the one that designed the Cloverfield creature and the little monsters coming off of it. Oh, the little parasite things? I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah. When they're going through the tunnels and they put the um, the light on and it's like, ah! That, that, uh, that, that scene made me claustrophobic, to be honest. But that's the point. That's what makes it yeah. so great. That's, it, it made me claustrophobic. Comes, it's like a horror movie. It's a monster movie. You get a little bit of everything. And when the military comes in and HUD's just screaming the whole time, mm-hmm. that was awesome. And yes, Deacon Logic, I was on the edge of my seat the whole entire time. The whole entire time. Especially that tunnel scene. That oh, I'm claustrophobic. I get claustrophobic very easily with movies. It doesn't matter if it's horror, action, whatever. If they're in a tight little space and you can't see anything, and then you hear things coming at you, mm-mm, no, I, I would have been gone. No, they're on their own. Ashley's out. Not having not wow. sticking around. Not sticking around. Did you see those things? I'm not sticking around. Nope. Coming out. Bye, My, friends. The other thing I love though, that ending where HUD is like watching the whole thing go down mm-hmm. and the military is like taking out the monster. He's like, Yeah, we got it. Come on, bitch. I'm like, whoa, this is epic. Yeah. The helicopter scene was a little anxiety ridden oh, for me yeah. too, because like that's when you're seeing it move around the city and then you see it like did it? I I still don't get this part. Did it throw something or did it jump at the helicopter? It ju- I think it jumped. Because I want to say it jumped. Because you see its face going right at. Yeah. Because some people are like, oh no, it's like it's it's hand. I'm like, no, that had to be its head. It had a head, but yeah. the helicopter. It just wanted you to see its face because that part got me. Because you know, imagine being in the air. You're totally vulnerable. You got this huge creature that or thing. You don't even know what it is, and then. There you go. You're going down. You know, rewatching it a second time, I was trying to think, who's Lily's the only one that survives. And you don't even know for sure. Yeah. Because you her helicopter sure. takes off and the other helicopters get taken down, but you don't know if she gets taken down. You don't know her fate. At all. Yeah. Hopefully she lived. We need a survivor somewhere. She's the somewhere. only survivor, yeah. yeah. I would think so. I would hope so. Because I mean, it never see, shows. Well, and that's the thing, too, is like, where, where how'd they get the camera? True. Like government, I guess, just came in, took it out. I mean, you would assume the Walking monster with metal detectors. Maybe the monster <laughs> finally died or something, or and maybe the other, it went back to go hide. Well, that too. The other thing I thought was cool was uh, I remember afterward they finally started spilling on the movie and mm-hmm. what how the project came about, and uh, it was Matt Reeve who actually said, "Oh no, that was a baby." Yeah, can you imagine what Mama looks like? Right. If that's the baby, then what does mama look like? Exactly. So I, when the Tin Cloverfield Lane trailer came out, there was so much speculation how the movies are going to tie together. Yeah. 
We'll see. And that brings us to the next one. Seemingly out of nowhere, J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot threw out a trailer for a film called Ten Cloverfield Lane, saying it would be a blood relative to Matt Reeves' film and not a direct sequel that would be set into the now-dubbed Cloververse. The film, directed by first-time filmmaker Dan Trackenberg, centers around three people, Howard, Michelle, and Emmett, who are stuck in an underground bunker together during a presumed apocalypse. Michelle doesn't trust Howard or his theories in what kind of apocalypse is transpiring and seeks Emmett's help to unravel the mystery of who Howard is and what is going on outside the bunker. But is Howard crazy or perhaps the most sane person in the bunker? I know you think he's insane. He's insane. <laughs> So we, we both saw the movie over this past weekend. I'm going to put it out there. I'm pretty sure you do not think so, but I thought this was my favorite movie of the year so far. Nyet. Poor K. No. Reasons. Uh, well, okay, so they haven't really said what these creatures are, so I automatically go with alien life because if it's unknown, then it's an alien I am not too huge on the whole alien genre, which is apparently blasphemy to some people. But, like, this movie's not bad. It's just... And be careful with spoilers, too. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, this movie's not bad. It's just... It's, it like, it doesn't give you the same feel as Cloverfield. And, like, to me, it feels more like what would be class Like, because it's not a direct sequel, and they say it's a blood relative. So, in my opinion, it's more like a spinoff, I guess would be a good way to put it. And it's just... You, I don't know. It's not the same as Cloverfield to me. Okay, so like I said, this was one of my favorite movies of the year. It is the best combination of all different genres. You have slasher, you have thriller, you have action movie, and you have sci-fi movie. There are little bits of sci-fi throughout the first half of the movie going into the last bit. Yeah. And then the very ending, it just goes full blast alien style. Mm -hmm. And so in my opinion, Mich Mary... Uh, uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead mm -hmm. could indeed be in the new Ripley if this series continues because this film is its own thing. Don't get yeah. don't get that wrong. It's not. It starts out with Mary Elizabeth Winstead, John Goodman, and the character of Emmett. They're in the bunker together. John Goodman, the entire time, you're questioning what his motives are and what he's doing. And whether or not he's actually insane or if he's telling the exactly. truth, you have no idea. And so he's talking about there could be Russians, there could be aliens, there could be a plague. Chemical. All sorts of stuff. Uh, what is it? The chemical spill. Chemical spill. Everything. You just don't know what's going on at all. It's kind of weird. I Okay. It's it's definitely got a lot of weird stuff to it. 409, you said it's like a horror kind of story and a lot of weird. I agree with that. There's a lot of horror to it. There's a lot of elements like that. John Goodman's performance alone. That's the thing, too, is you need to go into this movie thinking you're going to watch a thriller. Yes. And you're going to watch John Goodman give all these crazed performances as well as watch Emmett and Mary Elizabeth Winstead react to these performances and give – they are the audience's reactions. John Goodman's fantastic. He is movie, amazing though. in this movie. and. In the panel here, you get to see him right there. He's got Mary Elizabeth Winstead locked away in that room. In that other panel there, you get to see her seeing outside of the bunker for the first time. They have this awkward dinner. That was awkward and under Where he is basically saying, he is captain. You are going to listen to him or you will be booted out. He's alpha male. He is alpha male. And he's got all this military training. And that's the thing, too. He is... He has lots of nice motives, but every time he does something nice and shows off he can be nice, he counters it with these insane, crazy spouts. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, throughout the whole movie, you're watching these performances, and I was so enthralled by them, I could not look away. And that's what really got me going into it. So once, I'm not going to say which character, but one of the characters leaves the bunker. Once that happens, all hell breaks loose, and it becomes a full action sci-fi adventure movie. And it goes into the ending that could easily spawn a sequel. And that's the moment where I think we could get an alien going into aliens type of movie. And there's one line at the end. You guys pay really close attention. It's over a radio. And it's not very distinct, but it says something about the eastern seaboard. And I think that is the you know, kind of a hint. connection yeah. to the Cloverfield movie, the first one. So you get Bear McCreary music. He's on does the music for The Walking Dead. He does music for pretty much any horror movie in, you know, cinemas or television right now. He complements the score 
he accomplishes the movie with his score perfectly. Yes, he does. And Dan Trachtenberg gives such Hitchcockian scenes. It's amazing. And you're, it's just subtle nuances and scenes that you see little things as you hear something go off. And it is just anxiety Yeah, driving. and you're not knowing what it is because they're in an underground bunker and they're hearing noises that are coming from what sounds like outside. Exactly. And you have no idea what it is that they're hearing. They can't see what they're hearing. The whole That, that whole anxiety just kind of works itself up into like those, especially with John Goodman's character. He, well, he made me anxiety ridden the whole entire time. Well, see, that's the thing, Ash, is it, yeah. it, it elicits those feelings and that's what it's supposed to do. So if you guys go into this movie thinking of it as a thriller and work with it like that, it just becomes so much better and aw more awesome because there are so many movies out there that's like, oh, okay, well, here's the end of the movie and everything you just saw wasn't real or this was fake. No, it goes past that and it says it wasn't fake. This was real. It works as its own movie. It does. And for those who don't know, this movie is based off a script titled The Cellar, which was then reworked into a Cloverfield sequel. So a lot of people didn't know that. And like it's kind of like with the Hellraiser. They took a script, they put the Cloverfield name on it. As and if, it didn't suck. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I'm not saying this movie sucked. Like I enjoyed it. I'm just the type that says for some people, I think they might need to wait until it's available to rent, unless if you're like this one over here, then go to the theaters and see it. Um, if you go in thinking it's just don't connect it to the first Cloverfield, and then it works fantastic as its own movie, like he's been saying. But if you try to connect it like I did to the original Cloverfield, then you're gonna probably have those iffy feelings, like I do. But I will say, if you keep it separate, it's fantastic. But it's if you awesome. don't, it's you're going to be kind of sad. So I don't know what to tell you. It made me so happy. Yeah, and in a way, they do connect the movie because with Howard, he he made it known in the movie that he works on satellites for the military because throughout the whole entire movie, you know he's military. He makes it very well known. And in one of the scenes, um, Michelle, the Michelle character finds an envelope that's called the Bold Futra. And if you don't remember what that name is, that's the company that was responsible for the satellite that was crashing into the ocean in the very first Cloverfield. So that, that was re possibly responsible for the monster, you know, coming out and being like hey you disturbed me so that was like the one connection in the movie where it kind of like okay you know they're in the same universe you just don't know the time frame you don't know anything else it's kind of you're just kind of trying to figure out as the movie goes along but well, that that's was the, the one connection. that's the thing too is like you, she told me that earlier and i was like <laughs> oh my god you're right but you know don't try to make connections the whole movie yeah. i gave up after the first 10 minutes I was like wow these are damn good performances and a lot of people a lot of the critics are even saying like this is one of those Oscar performances you could get out of John Goodman. Definitely. He like, he's he made the movie. No matter what you think about Kevin Smith's Red State, John Goodman's performance in that movie was flawless. He brings that times 10 here, and the movie surrounding it is really excellent in of itself as well. There's like maybe one or two scenes that slow it down a bit, but it's all character building. It's character driven. And so that's what's so cool is like you get this character driven piece that turns in this like action sequence and in my opinion bad robots doing so well with these movies it elicit those feelings to me of like an old amblin movie like close encounters of the third kind or like you know the goonies or indiana jones and that was really cool for me so that's yeah. it could be the next amblin in my opinion so guys if you want go to the theater and watch this movie 10 cloverfield lane and then get back to us and tell us what you think of this film so you know freddie we talk about movies that have hit the big screen but what about movies that don't go into the cinema? Well, Ash, those movies get featured on our home video release segment of the week. So what do you have in store for us this time around? Oh my God, this is the weirdest film I've seen in a long time. I have an unusual little film that for a while was a Best Buy exclusive, but recently just made its way into Netflix in the form of Hell and Back. It's an adult stop-motion horror comedy film brought to us by Shadow Machine, the creators of the Adult Swim shows Mora Oral and Robot Chicken. That is one of the craziest movies I've seen in a while. So the story goes, Remy, Augie, and Kurt, they're three slacker friends that run a dilapidated carnival. Upon finding a book that shows the devil crying, the trio hopes that people will pay a lot of money to see it. Like idiots, they make a blood oath on the book, and Kurt ends up being dragged to hell. It's up to Augie and Remy to save him from Satan and his dastardly tortures. It's directed by Tom Guianis and Ross Schumann, who both have had cult hits with... Like I said before, Moral Oral and Tenacious D. And it's written by Giannis along with Hugh Sturbakov and Zeb Wells, one of the founders of Robot Chicken. He also writes the Nova comic book right now for those who love comic books. Ash, is it time for us to start arguing like crazy? I'm not sure. It depends. 
How did you feel about this movie? Then I'll tell you how I felt. How does one describe this movie? Definitely for like for people that have children, do not let your children watch this movie. Oh, for movie. God's sakes, don't let them watch this movie. If you do not have a dark sense of humor, do not watch this movie. But if you like those movies that are that dark humor where you're sitting there laughing at something that you know you probably shouldn't be laughing at, then I say watch this movie. But when he told me about this, I was like, okay, let's watch it. Let's see how it goes. I was up at one o'clock this morning watching this movie. And the first thing I want to do is jump on Facebook and be like, what did you just make me watch? And someone just asked, they didn't hear the name of the movie. It's called Hell and Back. It's on Netflix right now. Yeah. It- <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, okay, so like I said before, it was sort of Best Buy exclusive for a long time. I mm-hmm. heard about the movie coming out. I love old school Rankin Bass stop motion movies. I'm like, you know, idiot that's like, oh my God, it's time to watch The Year Without Rudolph or Year Without a Santa Claus or whatever the hell it's called nowadays. I'm always watching those specials when they come on TV for Christmas and Halloween and stuff like that. So and we I avoid f- them like the plague. We finally got an R rated stop motion one. Oh my God, I was so down for this. So I pick it up at Best Buy, I watch it, and honestly, it has its moments. It's not the best movie ever made. I think the biggest problem with it, it's, you know, Guys Who Made Robot Chicken and Moral Oral. Those are 15-minute shows. Moral Oral, it's got a narrative. Robot Chicken is a bunch of like, bam, 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 comedy, comedy. Yeah, and People in the chat want us to argue about this movie. Apparently, they want us to fight. What? Okay. <laughs> Apparently, people want to see you die. Everyone wants to see me die. Look Team at me. Team Ash. Whatever. I, I don't know what to fight about because I kind of agree with you. We, it's a weird movie. We kind of agree on this movie because it's. I don't know what he if he would be the one to recommend this movie. I would probably be the one that says be cautious, like be cautious when you watch this movie, because I mean it does involve religion. It has that dark sense of humor when it comes to religion. Oh I mean, God! If you're not devil, ready, if you're not ready to be like tortured with religious but, stuff, yeah. Man. So if you don't have that humor when it comes to the, like the religious aspects of this film, which I mean they do with dark humor, then I would totally say do not watch this movie. There's a stripper angel. Susan Sarandon. <laughs> Susan Sarandon is a stripper angel. And then you get TJ Miller from Cloverfield. He plays mm-hmm. Augie, who's the fat one the whole time. He's trying to make it with Dima, who's Mila Kunis, who's this badass purple demon lady. And it goes into like. Oh, gr- A Zeke said Team Ash. Team Ash. Oh, dude, it's always Team Ash. What, what's new about that? There's not even a yes, team I- to be on in this one. But you also get. Uh, so it goes in the Greek mythology with uh, Orpheus. Mm-hmm. And Orpheus is played by Danny McBride. Orpheus, if you guys don't know, is the only person to ever escape hell. And so he's a dude bro who's trying to bone anything and everything in sight. And Literally. Yeah, so it, it's really weird. He, he At one point, he has a song about how a tree raped him when he was a kid. Evil Dead style. Evil Dead style. And then later in the movie, uh, the rape tree, played by John H. Benjamin from Bob's Burgers, Comes back and says, I've always wanted to apologize to you for what I did to you as a little kid. Robe and he's just walking up like it's all okay. I know how you can make this up to me. Go rape the devil. And you're just like, okay. Like that one right there turned a lot of people off to it. And that was the moment where I was like, I love John H. Benjamin, but this is kind of getting a little weird here. So Deacon Logic in the chat says that he wants to start a hashtag called Chibi Von Horror Club. Ew. A whore fan club, apparently. And for those who don't know, that's a horrible nickname of mine given to me by my friends who all are going to get impaled later after this show. Or you can make them watch Helen back. That too. <laughs> just strap them down and clockwork, like clockwork orange style, just open their eyes and make them sit there and watch it over and over and over and over. I got C. War Cats who says yes to watch this movie just for Susan Sarandon's Stripper Angel. <laughs> Well, okay, my favorite scene in the whole movie, this is the stupidest thing in the world, but I don't know why. It just made me laugh my ass off. So you see all the different ways they torture people in hell, and one of them is there's a demon at a Pizza Hut Taco Bell combo stand. That was my favorite one, And too. the soul comes up, and he's like, uh, I'd like a pizza. And the, devil, the demon there is like, ha, 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 we're, we're out of pizza, buddy. And the soul's like, oh, well, it, it says Pizza Hut. And he's like, oh, yeah, but we only got, we only got Taco Bell. 
You want a taco? He goes, oh, I kind of want a cheese pizza. <laughs> Welcome to hell, he, buddy. He, he's like, yeah. Or, wait, or, or, order a pizza. He's order a like, pizza. And he's like, I want a cheese pizza. Ha ha ha, you're I, in hell. You can have a gordita. You're in hell. Welcome yeah. to hell. And he does it again later. I, is it the same demon that does it's it again later with the, the drink? Time. And he's giving him a drink. He's like, ha ha, that's not what it is. And then he keeps handing no, him no, he random gives, things. He gives him a soda. And he's like, ha yeah. <laughs> it's flat. And he's like, oh, can I have some milk? He goes, yeah, oh, yeah, he, sure. And he gives him the milk. And it's like, oh, it's, it's strawberry quick. Ah, it's strawberry quick. Welcome to hell, buddy. Because that's torture. Apparently. Yeah, and then apparently the the soul starts going. I'm like, okay, well, can I have this crappy product here? And he goes, no, no, no you, you order the right that thing. That soul is patient. Yeah, he's just like, whatever. <laughs> I would have clocked it's, him. It's so stupid, but it's for some reason, funny. like, I mean, if you like the robot chicken humor, there are bits and pieces of this movie I would highly recommend. Or like movies like This is the End. Yes, it's that's another good cartoon one. Cartoon version of that. Yeah. I would I, say. Mm. It's like the humor portion of it if, and okay, the religious aspect. If you could only it. get it at Best Buy, which is what I did, because I was like, oh boy, stop motion. I'm going to watch it. Yeah. I Thankfully, I bought Deathgasm the same day, so it was all bueno that day. But, dude, if you're like just sitting at home and you're like got nothing to do for an hour and a half and you want to watch something stupid and idiotic, hit Netflix, hit Helen. And back. you want people to question what you're watching? Your morality, <laughs> your sanity. I don't suggest watching at one in the morning because then your brain really starts questioning things. Yeah, I've definitely... Especially little tiny devil. Oh, yeah, which apparently uh, the devil is just a giant whiny baby. Like, seriously, whiny baby. That's why, like, they find the book of crying devil. Whiny, whiny devil. Very flamboyant. Yeah, he, he actually... So, in the movie, the devil, he's, like, big, hulking, and brawny for the uh, the demons. But whenever the stripper angel comes down, he turns in this, like, nice-suited pink Yeah, he's guy. pink. He yeah. turns pink. He's like, oh, hello. <laughs> I'm so in love with you. Come back to and me. And then... One of the one of the guys actually starts doing drugs with him in hell, and they're doing like what what are they doing? Um, uh, yeah, he's, he's huffing. Uh, oh, the whip, whip cream. is it whipped cream? He's doing whippets. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and he's, he's sitting he's there huffing whipped cream, and he's like talking about the angel, like, oh god, I love her, man. <laughs> oh yeah, and you're just like, what the hell is going on here? They're like, wait, he he's supposed to be the human sacrifice, and now he's doing drugs with him. Oh, and if you guys want to hear Susan Sarandon sing in this movie, she does have a little duet about her uh, lady parts <clears throat> and Danny <clears throat> McBride's <clears throat> private parts doing <clears throat> things <clears throat> and stuff. <clears throat> I don't know how much I want to talk about that. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, like I said, it's if you're really bored, go watch it on Netflix, but don't buy it. And do not watch it with children. <laughs> no, not at all. God, no. Yeah, so, well, that was our show for today. Full of monsters of all shapes and sizes from children to teenagers, children who grow up to be monsters, and even the 300 foot tall variety. Hopefully you've learned a little something about some new movies and just maybe feel the need to dip into the horror vault and rewatch a few classics. We would like to thank you for, uh, thank all of you for coming in and listening to our horror filled rants and remind you that if you have anything to add to any of these topics, feel free to, to continue this discussion outside of the show on any social media using the handle Nerd Ninja Net. We would also like to let you know about a new show starting tomorrow on Nerd Ninja TV, the Nerd Ninja Girl Show. So tune in at 8.30 for its debut. She has been Ash Von Horror. I have been your Fright Master, Freddy Ruiz. And we thank you for watching the Nerd Ninja Horror Show. Hashtag Team Ash. Sweet dreams.